Hi guys, welcome to this talk today about platinum printing. Platinum printing was invented in 1873 by a chap called William Willis. He was trying to create a more permanent print, alternative to silver printing. <laughs> Platinum being the most stable metal in nature allowed him to create permanency in the print, as well as creating a very unique artistic photographic style. Typically today, most prints are made with platinum and palladium, therefore prints are called platinum and palladium prints. About 15 years ago, I attended a course with a friend on platinum printing and contact printing. Before then, we had no idea what it meant. But that really paved the way for me to understand the process and learn how to present my work in a different way. Over the time, I've dabbled with both inkjet printing and platinum prints. But about five years ago, I decided to really focus on platinum printing. And now I'm printing my images from my travels and my, my life experience in platinum to create a body of work. Platinum printing is a member of a family of printing techniques called contact printing. Typically, you take a piece of rag paper and you hand coat it with a light sensitive emulsion. Then you have a negative, which is the same size as the final image. They are then compressed together and placed into a vacuum frame and exposed to ultraviolet light. That will convert the digital image to an analog image. The print is then processed through a developer bath. The developer bath then creates the image and removes the iron based chemistry that's left on the paper. Then you clean it and then you dry it, flatten it, and mount the picture. Platinum printing is a daylight process, therefore you don't need a dark room to do it. And therefore it's really suitable for home-based printing. And actually, as you'll see the process today, we can do it in a very small space, as long as you're organized and still create beautiful prints. I like that platinum prints are different from other printing techniques. Platinum prints have a very long tonal range. So it means you've got really long highlights, really long shadows, and a lovely midpoint. They do look very, very different to a silver print, much softer if you like. I like the way that the image sits in the fibers of the paper and not on top of the paper in some kind of coating. Some people say that the platinum prints will last for over a millennia, which is a thousand years, which I think is a really lovely way to present your work. Under certain lighting conditions, the platinum print will absorb the light and reflect it back to the viewer, giving a sparkling effect to the print. I think this is a very unique way to view these beautiful handmade prints. Platinum printing is one of the highest standards of the photographic techniques. If you've ever seen a platinum print in a gallery or up close, you would see what I mean. They have a depth and they have a presence that no other photographic technique can really match. They are a very special, beautiful way of seeing the final image in a print. And that is primarily because platinum and palladium are noble metals, which gives these prints a certain value, and it means they're collectible by photographic collectors. Platinum prints are all handmade, archival, and are very unique. It's very difficult to recreate the same image to look the same way, due to the fact that you have humidity and temperature at play, and also the way you coat the paper and the way you develop the image is all different in every way. I have a friend, we were talking about this the other night, and he used to print platinum prints in the south and has now moved to the north. And his prints look very different just because the conditions are very different from when he's printing his prints now to what he was back then. Platinum prints have a permanence, which means they can last forever as long as you look after them and look after the paper that they're printed on. They won't fade like a traditional inkjet print or a silver print. So it means that I can make prints that can be literally handed down through generations so other people of other generations can see how we live our lives today and the sort of traveling experiences we have, the stories we make and the people we meet. Platinum printing fell into decline in the First World War when platinum was used in the war effort. It was not until the 1960s that it was reimagined by a chap called Irving Penn who spent a lot of time researching and re-engineering the process. Irving Penn is one of the people that inspired me to make platinum prints, who brought something back from almost the brink, but also people like William Ingram, George Tice, and many others 
who allow me to focus on the platinum printing process and try and keep it alive for other generations and future generations alike so they can experiment with the process as well. There are five steps to this process which we'll go through today. One is coating the paper with a light sensitive emulsion. Two is making the negative. Three is exposing the negative to a ultraviolet light to make the image on the light sensitive paper. The fourth stage is to develop the image and the fifth stage is to clean it, dry it and flatten the image and then present it in however you'd like to present the work. I think the secret of success of platinum printing in a small space is really just being organized. You can break the process down into its individual elements. For example, coating the paper can be done without having the exposure box and all the developing equipment out at the same time. So it means you can partition the process and do bits of it. And as long as you tidy up the bits that you've been using before you start the next part of the process, that means you can do it in a very small space. It also means it won't trip you up when you're trying to do multiple things at the same time. It's a very slow process and very considered. So it does mean that you have to focus on what you're doing because you really don't want to make mistakes when you're doing this. So that will just focus the mind. So organization, I think, is the key to success to making these types of prints. OK, let's head on over and start to learn how to coat the paper with a light sensitive emulsion. Okay, so welcome to step one. This is coating paper for the platinum printing process. The objective here is to show you how to coat the paper with some uh, distilled water and some light sensitive chemistry. This is uh, the paper we're going to use today. This is a paper called Rivier Platinum by Legion Paper. It's 100% uh, rag, um, pH neutral and it's made for platinum printing. Um, I really like this paper, I think it's fantastic. There are many other types of paper that you can use. There are, um, there's Archer's Patine, which is a favorite among platinum printers. There's um, Berger, COT320. They're all um, pH neutral rag papers and they're all, they're all great. The reason I like this paper is because um, it holds the image really well. You get nice fine grain, you get lovely edges, and you also get nice blacks and a nice tonal range. It's a really lovely paper. It's uh, smooth on one side, rough on the other side. And that's because you coat uh, the light sensitive emulsion on the rough side. The paper is really important in the platinum printing process, ultimately this will carry the image through its lifetime. The importance of the archivalness of the paper is it will protect the permanence of the print and the uh, prints will last for you know, a millennia, over a thousand years. The beauty is that you can look at it in a light and the light will reflect back to you due to the platinum and palladium metals in the print. It is just beautiful when you see it. It just sparkles like the sun sparkles in the sea. So the first thing we're going to do is, um, you know, we are going to coat this with light sensitive chemicals. So to get this paper ready for the uh, coating process, we've got some masking tape and we're holding it down. And that's because when we are coating with either the distilled water, or with the chemistry, we don't want the paper to move and spoil the effort of the coating. So the first thing I'm going to do is just write down some details about the chemistry, the date and the time, the type of paper, the exposure time, and the curve used for this print. So if I need to recreate it, I can do. So this is a special paper, and under the guidance of the paper manufacturer, it does need coating with distilled water before you put any of the chemistry on the paper and that's because this chemistry and that's because this paper is notorious for uh, soaking in liquid very very quickly so if you just applied the light sensitive chemistry on the paper straight away you would find that you need a lot of chemistry to get an even coating on the paper okay so we add some distilled water and that will slow down the rate of absorption which means that then we'll get an even coat 
And the evenness is really important because that means it's going to give you that long tonal range for which platinum's known for, and it's going to be consistent across the print. And now we're working with these papers. We want to make sure we look after them. I want to make sure that we're very careful when adding anything to the surface of the paper. So any kind of movement of the brushes or fingerprints could mark the paper. So for that, I just use this little soft brush. It's important to note that when you are coating the paper, you don't want to use anything that's uh, metal based or iron based because that can have an impact on the print. So we just get this brush and we just basically move this over the surface of the paper. Legion paper recommend um, 40 drops of water per 10 by 8 print. We put that water onto my paper, like so. And then I'm just going to use this really soft hake brush to spread it. Now, this has got marked on it distilled water because I have two um, similar brushes. So this is just for distilled water. I don't want to contaminate this with any other chemistry. So then I'm just going to coat this on the paper. Okay, that will be ready for coating in about five minutes. So to do that, I'm just going to put a timer on with my phone. Okay, so while that's drying, that creates an opportunity to go and work on the edit of the image in Lightroom and Photoshop, and also to start printing the digital negative that we'll use in the exposure process a little bit later on. Okay, so let's talk about making the negative from the digital image. First of all, platinum prints really like contrasty images. So that's really useful to bear in mind when you're editing in Lightroom and Photoshop. So my editing today will start in Lightroom CC and then move across to Photoshop to actually combine the image into a pre-made negative template. Lightroom CC actually now contains all of my images that I've ever shot. And this allows me to organize my images and edit anywhere I like. So on my desktop, on my iPad, or on my phone. Another reason that I moved to Lightroom CC was its intuitive interface and consistency across many devices. The image that I'm gonna work on today is actually from Madagascar, and it's from a hike whilst on a cycling tour. The reason why I'm printing this image is because it resonates strongly with me. We just hiked up Chameleon Mountain and then at the top had to sit out a huge thunderstorm. On the way home, we visited this beautiful village with picture-perfect houses. I made the choice a few years ago to buy a mechanical film camera, mainly to reduce the reliance upon batteries, especially on cycling trips and adventure holidays. I find this style of photography allows me to focus on the scene at hand and is more responsive to what's going on. I'd rather be patient and wait for the shot than rather take many, many images that I don't really need and miss the one I want. The mechanical camera simply allows me to take pictures. I managed to grab this shot by quickly observing the lady coming out of the front door of her house and waited until she was partially down the steps before I clicked the shutter. I had one shot to get the image and that's the shot you see here. I shot this image on 35 mm prime lens with a roll of Portra 400. I then scanned it into Lightroom and converted it to black and white. The first step of the editing process is to ensure that I'm working with the whole tonal range of the image. So I'll click the auto button in Lightroom. As well as getting the image to a great start point, this saves me bags of time later in the process. In Lightroom, I'll reference the histogram and we'll work on the basic adjustments, highlights, shadows, black and white points, as well as black and white filters to get the image nice and contrasty. Of course, Lightroom is non-destructive, so I can always go back to the edits and refine if I need to. This is important as it's likely that I'll need to print this image multiple times to make sure I get it just right. As an aside, it's worthwhile experimenting with clarity and dehaze filters 
as these can have a positive impact on the image, especially with this process. In the image, I really like the lady on the steps. So to bring her out as a focus point, I'll add a radial filter and adjust the exposure and shadow recovery along with the brush on the filter to ensure that the viewer can't see the adjustments in the final print. For any image printed in platinum, it's worthwhile adding additional sharpening to the image. The printing process will naturally add softening to any edges. So that's the Lightroom section done. By opening in Photoshop, you will see the camera raw adjustments. These are the same as I made in Lightroom. All I have to do to bring them into Photoshop is click open as a smart object. So I can keep editing and refining until I've made and reviewed the first print. Once the first edit is done, I will save the file as an uncompressed TIFF and load it into the platinum printing negative template that I've already created for all of my negatives. Because I'm limited to the physical size of the light box and the transparency film I'm using, I'm limited to a maximum print size. The template has this built in, so it means that all of my negative will be the same size. Once I put the image in the template between the guides, I can convert the image to create the negative. The negative is fundamental as it's used to convert the image from digital to analog. In this negative image, you will see to the right the step wedge. This step wedge shows the tonal range of the print once printed. This will then allow me to measure the darkest black point, white point, as well as the grayscale in between. You will see the numbers in the step wedge. These are the percentage values of 256 levels of gray. Measuring this step wedge once printed will allow me to see if the print is getting the correct exposure in the light box. In the next part of the process, we will coat the paper with a mix of chemicals. These chemicals will be a combination of iron, platinum, and palladium salts in liquid form. Before we print the negative, we need to calibrate how the digital tones will map to the analog chemical tonal range. We do this through a curve, which is a mathematical way to convert digital pixels to a physical printed image, aligning the tonal range of the platinum and palladium salts. The curve can be a bit time consuming to create and is the hardest part of the process, but nowadays there are many books and videos around to help with this calibration. The curve is applied when I print the negative and the software I'm using is called Quad Tone Rip. This is via the Adobe Print Utility. There are also many other ways to print these types of negatives, just have a look on YouTube. To print the negative, I'm going to use Pictorico transparency film on my Epson 3800. If we look at the printed output, you will see a range of green and black tones that make the negative. These tones allow blocking of ultraviolet light in the light box through the exposure process, which in turn will create the tonal range in the step wedge and create the final image. Once printed, I'll let this negative dry and cure overnight before exposing. Now it's time to put the light sensitive emulsion across the paper, which will get a nice even coating because the uh, water has um, absorbed into the surface, which stops the light sensitive material from being absorbed too quickly. And to do that, we will just use our soft brush again, just to remove any surface dust, light ashes, anything from the surface that might spoil the print once it comes out of the light box. Okay, so then what we'll do is we'll use this brush. This is a very small hake brush. I do have some more upstairs, but this is great for applying the emulsion to the paper. So what we'll do is we will use our light sensitive chemicals, which I have four. We have ferric oxalate number one, ferric oxalate number two, palladium and platinum. So what we'll do is we will just put enough chemistry in a very small medicine beaker and we're gonna put our light sensitive emulsion into it. Now we just need to make sure these are in the right order we have some notation on the paper, so we know how we're going to uh, print it. This is my combination that I've worked out. It's um, ferric oxalate, number one, number two, and then we have palladium, and we have platinum. So we're gonna put some of these in. So first we're gonna choose number one, that's number two, that's, uh, that's number one. So put these in order. Number one, number two, that's the palladium and that's the platinum. Okay, so we're just gonna put in 
swim drop to this. Now this does get a bit sticky because obviously the iron builds up. Now I normally use some paper towels to capture this, so it's worthwhile doing that. So we're just going to measure out, in this case, 18 drops. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I do it in batches of 10 because it's just easier to remember, especially on bigger drop counts. And we'll put some number two in. So we're going to have, again, this one gets a bit sticky as well. In this case, we're going to have a few of those. So I'm just doing it nice and slowly so I don't get it um, mixed up. And then the palladium goes in. So quite a lot of palladium, so that's two lots of ten. So one, two, three. So you can see that um, the bigger the prints, the more of this you'll need. Uh, and these are not, not cheap, they're quite expensive. So you want to make sure that when you're testing, you're only testing a little bit. You can cut the paper up into little sections as well. So that when you're testing in the light box, you're not uh, wasting chemistry. So I'm going to take my little, um, my little brush again, the little this one here, and I'm just going to make sure this is clean of any surface debris. Now that's done, we will then take our brush, I'll um, put a little bit of water on the end of that brush to stop the fibres of the brush absorbing too much of the chemistry. Just pat that dry with a paper towel. Okay. And then we're ready for coating. Then we'll just coat the paper with the light sensitive emulsion until we've got a nice, even coat. But I can see some little marks left from the brush here, so little um, hairs from the brush may appear, but that's okay, because that will come off later on when we use the other, the other brush. Um, and that's okay, that should be big enough for the, for the negative. Okay, so we'll let that dry, and then we'll give that 20 minutes, and that will give enough time to dry. It won't be bone dry, it'll be just surface dry, and then we'll use a hairdryer to finish off that drying process. So once that is dry with the hairdryer, we will then take that upstairs and we'll put it into the exposure box. Now you can kind of go crazy with this stuff. You can buy really expensive ones that are properly um, you know, designed for this process or any alternative um, printing process. The, the difference here is that I made this with my, my dad uh, many, many years ago, and we just you know bought some lights and put them in, wired it up with a fan, and, and off you go. Um, it's got a load of UV lights in there. It's got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, and 12. 12 lights in there. So then I'll get the, the paper, as you can see what we just coated downstairs. Normally I coat here at the same time and keep it in one room and just clean up after myself after each section, but I'm just using um, the table downstairs as we've been doing throughout the session today just to give more space. And here's the, uh, here's the coated paper. We also have our trusty soft brush as well. And you know, as we did before, we'll just get rid of any surface debris because we don't want that on the print. I've had this contact frame for, for you know, almost 15 years. It's got a very simple um, glass um, frame to put between the lights and the negative and the, the um, sensitized paper. And the calibration itself is based upon the distance of the lights to the, to the glass. That's where all my um, measurements are done from. Um, so that the major thing here is to not change the distance between the lights and between the um, the negative once that's been calibrated for your chemistry and the curve you're using. So that's the three elements or four elements that you need to kind of really consider when you're doing this. 
as you can see here, here's a negative. So, you know, just to reinforce what we have here is we've got the black areas, which will protect the chemistry and the paper from the exposure uh, process itself and from the ultraviolet light process. So therefore it will stay white and not go to black. We have the step wedge here. So you see the see-through area here, which is 100, that will go to black. And we see the black area zero will go to white because that's black protecting the paper from the chemistry or protecting the paper from the ultraviolet light. And then you see these step wedges in between. So you see the 50% ones in the middle and everything else. So your, your curve that you're applying in the negative is really controlling the amount of chemistry that will be uh, subject to the ultraviolet light and then you've got the negative itself. Um, as I mentioned before, the reason I like the black edges here and to keep it nice and clean on the print is because I like a nice clean edge. Just gives me uh, options when I frame it. I also think it looks nice as well. And then of course, what we do is we put this against to expose and get ready for exposing. We put this in the box. Um, I use a little bit of masking tape to hold the print down. You can make a, just a little quick brush to make sure it's nice and clean. Now, some people would say this might damage the negative. I've not noticed it in my years of printing, but you know it might do, but just be careful with that. Also, you could use a little magnifying glass to make sure everything's all sharp in the print and, it, and it's exactly as you want it to be. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to get the sensitive paper or the sensitized paper and you're going to put that face down against the negative. I'm just going to eyeball this and register it like that. So just to make sure I've got enough coverage of the sensitized area against the negative. Seems okay. And then I'm just going to put the top on the contact frame and just pin it into position with. Okay, once that's all done, we're going to put that on a timer for 10 minutes. And I'm just going to flip the switch and start the process. You can now hear the fans go on to cool down the ultraviolet light while it's in the exposure box. And then we'll leave that there to do its magic and then take it to its next logical part of the process. Okay, so here we are in uh, my spare bathroom. You can probably hear the echo going on. It's quite a small space. Hi okay, guys, so uh, welcome to this last step of the process. This is the most exciting part where we get to develop the print that we've handcrafted. So what we have in here are some uh, developing trays, which I'll show you in one second. We also, behind me, you can see a chemical developer. This one is ammonium citrate. I keep it in a conical flask when I'm developing. I find it easier just to pour onto the, um, to the paper, which we'll get onto in a second. You'll also see three containers. These contain my cleaning chemical, which is a EDTA. Okay, so you can see in the bath actually is where I do my developing. You can see a print is already in there. That's cleaning from earlier. I made a test print and I made a few test prints actually before this uh, video just to make sure that the out output was, was good. There's also a developing tray in there which we'll use for this print just now. The, the print you see here is, um, is yellow from the light sensitive emulsion. This is the iron based emulsion. So that's what the yellow is. And you'll see, once we've exposed, you'll see this residual image in the um, light sensitive uh, chemistry that we put onto the paper. So the idea here is that we will um, develop this with ammonium citrate. We will place it into the developing tray and pour ammonium citrate over it. And what that will do is it will bring out the image like magic and then you're left with the yellow residue. The cleaning process is designed to get rid of the yellow residue, which is the iron, and it must be clean 
Um, so all the yellow must go, otherwise the print will rust in time. So as long as it's cleaned properly and looked after at this point in time, it will last for the, uh, a long time as well as, well, as long as the paper will, will last for as well. So, uh, okay, here we go. Let's, uh, let's process this print. Okay, now we get our, in this case, ammonium citrate. We pour this over the exposed image. And we leave that there to fully develop for about two or three minutes. So here you can see the print after it's been developed, it's generated that nice long tonal range that you can see in the step wedge. And at the moment now we're putting it into a EDTA cleaning bath and that will clear away any iron residual that's left in the, in the print. That's all the yellow bits around the area. So you see that kind of gradually um, be removed, leaving pure paper white. And then you'll see that nice bright paper white come through in um, in the zero spot, which will give you that nice contrast all the way through to, to black. Um, we'll put that through three baths of cleaning solution or EDTA, and then um, I'll put it in some normal water, and I'll probably leave that overnight just to um, get rid of any final deposits, and then what I'll do is dry it. And I normally put it on a glass um, pane and just leave that overnight to, uh, to dry thoroughly. And then I'll press it under some books, probably for about a week to completely flatten it. And then I'll be ready to either go into my portfolio box or go into a frame. So I'm pretty happy with that. Um, so yeah, so uh, that was a good, uh, good result, I think. So thanks for joining me on this journey today. I hope you enjoyed it, I know I did. It was a fairly whistle-stop tour of the process. And hopefully you've learned something, you've satisfied a little bit of curiosity, and maybe it's demystified part of the process. But there certainly has been a lot of things we've covered. So we've looked at coating the paper with platinum palladium salts. We made a digital negative using Lightroom Photoshop and then printed that on a transparency paper. We then exposed that through an ultraviolet light box and then developed the print using ammonium citrate. We then cleaned the print and dried it, and now we've flattened the print just using some books. The final part of the process is to really look at how the print looks when we mount it. So you can see here, here's the final print, and I typically use a very light gray card mount. You can see then, if we put the print under the mount, you see it really finishes off that printed image, and I think the really light gray tone really suits the cool tone of the platinum and palladium print. So that's the final step in the process for making prints. But what I would like to do is just take you through some prints that I've made earlier and some stories that are attached to those. We were at a festival in India, at the Tsara festival, and this is a guy who was just going actually to the store just to pick up some groceries. And he's there dressed as his deity Kali. And I just stopped him. We couldn't speak the same language clearly, but I just stopped him and I just grabbed this one shot and he was quite obliging to do that. And, you know, it just tells me a lot about this festival and how kind of wacky it is. Dussehra is a, is a festival that can and varies deeply across India. Um, and I find that um, the pit types of people you meet are so friendly, but also look kind of a bit kind of wild and chaotic at the, at the same time. This is actually at the same festival. We were just walking on the... Uh, on the beach to where the uh, main temple is, where they go and um, pray to their deity and give gifts of fire and other such things. And he was just on the, on the beach and I just uh, stopped him and asked him if he'd mind me taking his, uh, his photograph. It's lovely, I think, you know, this was shot on film, uh, again, Portra 400, and what I like about it is the sheen, 
that you get in his uh, shoulders. And also, you know, the, the, the normal people in the background and he's dressed in this uh, kind of really wacky uh, kind of makeup and, and uh, everything else about what he's wearing. What's great about the platinum process is that actually you can take really old images and print them through the process and it just makes them look really aged. So this is a shot that I took in uh, Agra many, many years ago. And um, I just saw this chap and his son on a camel and asked him for a photograph and it was in the right perfect place, just opposite the Taj with the reflection in the water um, it was just perfect. And I think, you know, going back to um, Agra nowadays, um, the water isn't there anymore or isn't as deep as that. So that was kind of a once in a lifetime moment to get everything. And the timing of the guy on the camel or the child on the camel with the two temples behind him with equidistant between the two, for me is great separation and just a really lovely, for me, a really nice captured image that tells a great story. This was a, an odd chap in um, Myanmar, Burma, and we just climbed up this temple and obviously lots of um, people were leaving at the same time. But this guy decides to uh, walk down the concrete or walk down the brick steps in a very unusual way. You know, this is quite high off the ground and if he, if he fell, that would be, uh, it would kind of hurt. Anyway, so um, yeah, I, I shot this again, one shot, just saw this happen and just took it. And I, I really like the dynamics of the image and, um, and what's going on in there. You never know when you're going to get a really unusual picture. Um, and this was at a, I think it was at the Tate Gallery in London. And I just remember seeing this um, monkey as a statue. And I just thought he looks kind of, you know, it's a bit suspicious that he's up to something. And I grabbed the shot and I didn't develop it for so long afterwards. And then I, I um, got it developed and, and scanned it in. I looked at it and it's like he's up to some kind of trouble. And I just love this image because it looks a bit kind of odd and, and something's about to, about to kick off. Um, but he looks kind of real, which is kind of odd. Um, but I know that a lot of people see this and think it's a bit, bit weird, but uh, I really like it. I think it's fantastic. Here's another shot that I took on a film. Again, it was very dark and I just had some Portra 400 in my camera. I just grabbed this shot, exposed it for the best I could. Um, and it's actually IYY's um, chandeliers made of bicycles. Um, and I just love the tonal, the tonal range. And here I think the platinum print really shines with all those subtle tonal ranges, especially in the glass above the actual chandelier. Um, and then, of course, all the detail in the chandeliers and the silver of the frames really brings it to life. And for me, it's um, a really strong and powerful image that tells a great story. I find it's got really nice leading lines and it really captures the imagination and never lets you down, I find. It's, there's always something to look at in the picture. There's always something to discover. As your eye goes in from the left, following through the frames, it takes you to the glass above and then the arc of the glass brings you back round to the um, bicycles and you keep in that um, arc if you like and that circular motion keeps you in the frame uh, and really kind of is very difficult to leave I find that image I find it uh, you know is intoxicating This is a really rare shot um, of a scene at the Kumbh Mela in, uh, in India, just outside Varanasi. This was the 144th Kumbh, so it's a, it's a, it's a um, mother of all Kumbhs. This is where all the young Naga Sadhus are coming for that um, initial entry into the life of a Naga Sadhu. Um, 
what I love about it is uh, I love the guy at the bottom with his conch calling to whoever is calling to to kind of, I guess, give these guys um, a good future as part of this religion. But you never see this sort of scene. I captured it on a bridge, actually, as we were walking past and I just grabbed it with my uh, with my camera. And again, something very unusual about this this image and what's going on. Here's another shot of the Cumbermella. I really like this chap and his son in the background looking over his shoulder. I just love his detail in his his headgear and, and the way that kind of falls across his um, back and his shoulders. And I really like his necklace. I think it tells a nice story and kind of very situational about where he was in the Cumb at the time. Um, yeah, I really like this, this image. Here's a shot of a Kushti wrestler in Varanasi, this young boy. And the plan and print really brings out all the dirt in his skin, all the different tones that it makes as it's caked over the heat just after he's been fighting. I love the stare that just outside the frame shows the intensity of these wrestling matches in the mud. Here's a shot that I took in Mongolia. Um, we'd followed these eagle hunters to catch a balapan, a small baby eagle, that they were going to train and take with them on their, on their journeys. And you can see the rock face. So we, we stood a little bit down the mountain while they were going up the mountain. And we stopped there. And I'm pleased I did now, because if you look just in that rock on the right side, you can see a figure just resting as he's going to catch the Viribalapan. The good news is they didn't catch it. It was too dangerous. The rocks were too sharp and the ropes they had would have been cut and someone would have got hurt. So luckily in that case, they didn't catch the eagle. But this is quite a common occurrence in Mongolia to go and catch the new... Um, new golden eagle for uh, for catching um, animals and, and, and general uh, lifestyle that they have across there. It's a really old print that I shot in the Taj Mahal, I think, or it could be a red fort. I can't remember. It was so long ago on a really old digital camera, like six megapixels or something. I love the intensity of black that platinum gives and the subtle tonal range. I think it's magical, the image, and it's obviously quite a spiritual time for this guy praying. These are kind of some fun shots that I shot in Los Angeles. This actually is a, a plane that they've converted into some kind of sculpture. Um, quite interesting. It's also very interesting from different angles. But again, you can see the tonal range of the platinum really playing well across all those different engine parts and different parts of the aircraft. And then you can see another view here from a different angle showing the tubes as part of that what was aircraft. So I hope you enjoyed those photographs and the stories behind them. That's all for the talk today, but I'd like now to move on to the Q&A so you can ask questions about the process or photography in general or anything else you'd like to get off your chest. So thanks very much and I'll speak to you in one second.